As you may or may not know, we are big fans of two-wheelers on this channel. From electric bicycles to e-scooters, mopeds and of course motorcycles, we think that our transition to electric vehicles needs to include all forms of wheeled transportation for it to have maximum impact. But while the electric bicycle industry is really, truly taking off with more choice than we've ever seen before and every type of bicycle from city commuters to off-road mountain bikes, cargo haulers and even electric assisted racers now available for those with the money to spend, the world of electric motorcycles is taking a lot longer to mature with a really wide and varied choice of models available to buy that are dependent on where you live in the world. And if you're in a market where the idea of affordable electric motorcycles feels a little like a pipe dream, you might want to know why some markets get commuter-friendly, budget-oriented two-wheelers while other markets get few or none at all. The answer, though, is all down to how motorcycles are viewed in different parts of the world. As I've noted before on this channel, it takes a massive amount of investment to establish a new electric vehicle brand and build a new electric vehicle. And much of the associated costs for that come from the research and development of a vehicle's drivetrain, their battery pack and power electronics. And in the last decade, we've seen automakers, both startups and legacy brands, work to streamline the development process, finding new ways of iterating design and bringing about technology changes, establishing partnerships with companies, very often whose expertise in battery technology and drivetrains can help accelerate development and deployment of new models. And as a consequence, we're now really starting to see some truly compelling and increasingly more affordable electric vehicles, specifically cars, hit the marketplace. But in the electric motorcycle world, things are a little different. And the marketplace itself is extremely fragmented on a global scale, with a massive variation of models available to buy that are entirely dependent on where you live and what your local cultural impressions of motorcycles is as a whole. And it all depends on if motorcycles are viewed as a primary or secondary form of transportation. What's more, companies that might exist and thrive in one market might not in another. And we have some significant thoughts about that. In case you're not aware, I am of course talking about the chasm between countries in large parts of Asia, Africa and South America, where motorcycles are not only essential primary forms of transportation to get people to and from work, school and shops, but are sometimes even used in some parts of the world as taxis, versus the way that motorcycles and scooters are viewed in large parts of North America, Europe and Oceania, where, for the most part, they are treated as subservient to the almighty SUV and pickup truck and therefore tend to be ridden primarily for leisure. I am, of course, making massive, sweeping, humongous generalisations. When Kate Walton Elliott and I both lived in the UK and we were reasonably close to each other in terms of distance from each other's homes, we both went through periods of time where our motorcycles became our primary form of transportation between Bristol and Bath, often because our respective classic cars were feeling a little sick and our partners had our other vehicle or we didn't have one. And I still have friends in the UK today who only ride motorcycles and don't even own a car. There are even some in North America who are the same. But for the most part, motorcycles are things in Europe and North America and Oceania that you take when the weather is nice, and thus they're more often than not seen as a non-essential form of transportation. To understand this massive divide, it's probably worthwhile examining why two-wheelers are 
more popular in much of Southeast Asia, Africa and South America than in many other regions of the world. And in case you didn't already realise, it's down to everything from climate to total cost of ownership, a robust local manufacturing and repair network, and in some cases road quality and congestion, as well as rules of the road. Climate is the first obvious one. If the average temperature where you live is well above freezing for most of the year and riding a motorcycle or a scooter isn't going to leave you chilled to the bone, getting around on two wheels might actually be preferable to a car that may or may not have air conditioning. This is in stark contrast to having to commute in the depths of winter when it's significantly below freezing and there's an implicit requirement you wear a massive number of layers to stay warm. And that's before you even consider the risk of you coming off being dramatically increased due to snow, ice and just terrible weather. And remember, right now I'm talking about motorcycles and scooters in general, even if you have a throbbing engine between your legs, the heat that comes off it in the depths of winter isn't going to be enough to keep you warm. Even your hands can't often be warmed at stoplights through your thick winter gloves if you're riding a puny 125. Ask me how I know. Go on. This is before we even examine things like congestion, of course. I'm aware that the majority of people watching this video are based in either the US or Canada, and save for a few exceptions in those countries, you generally can't filter through stationary traffic on a motorcycle or a scooter. But in many other countries around the world, there's nothing to stop you from weaving through traffic on two wheels, which can dramatically cut down your commute time, save you fuel, and obviously help to reduce congestion into the bargain. Although, I'll also be fair, there's an increased safety risk there, at least if you don't filter safely. There's a practical element too. In places where road quality isn't so great, so Boston, and road rules are considered a suggestion, so maybe California, being able to weave around potholes and dodge other road users is a bonus. And to seal the deal, motorcycles are far more efficient with resources when they are being built, require less to transport when they break down, and they all tend to follow the same basic design principles too. In fact, the simpler the better. In many nations where motorcycles are more important than the mighty automobile to the average person and ingenuity trumps official parts replacement, the cheaper and simpler the vehicle, the more likely it is to be repaired and back on the road in a shorter span of time as possible. Just watch all of those motorcyclists who've travelled around the world on expensive motorcycles, some of whom have ended up replacing said motorcycles for a local cheap model. Because of everything I've just said, motorcycles make more sense unless you have a lot to carry, especially if you live in a densely populated area. And because so many people ride in many of the places where motorcycles are popular, it's much more socially acceptable and maybe even expected that you ride a motorcycle or a scooter as your daily driver, people are more likely to expect a motorcycle on the road. And that means that other road users are much more attentive to the existence of people using forms of transport that aren't the aforementioned almighty SUV and pickup. That said, the motorcycle market is now far more varied, even in motorcycle-friendly markets, than it once was. For example, there are now many more lifestyle-focused motorcycles, both electric and non-electric, coming to the fore in India, Indonesia, China and other markets where traditionally two-wheelers have dominated. They're often sold with a heavy emphasis on younger, more affluent buyers who want a motorcycle but have a mixed-use case scenario and a desire for much more in the way of onboard gadgets and tech too especially when it comes to electric motorcycles and scooters, that means those choices will include things like battery swap capable models. But those models that they buy are just as much a lifestyle choice as they might be a practical commuting solution. 
The difference in use case here is stark. In markets where cars are the primary form of transportation and where it's more likely a commute will include higher speed travel, motorcycles are designed very differently to parts of the world where they're considered more day-to-day -day use. If you're not commuting on a two-wheeler, luggage carrying capabilities, robustness and day-of-day -day ease of use is far less important, leading to motorcycle models that focus on long-distance cruising and speed over the ability to literally throw it off a building, pick it up and then ride off into the sunset. And if you think that didn't happen, I'm afraid to say it did. For partly entertainment purposes. BBC Top Gear once famously threw a Honda Cub off a building and then got it running again. The erstwhile uh, so Honda Cub isn't exactly the most exciting ride out there, but its legendary robustness is why it sold so well in massive swathes of the world. It's also why some people, slightly bonkers British people, have driven one round the world, but that's a different channel and a different video. Hi, Ed Marsh. <laughs> of course, I am making sweeping generalizations here because if you are a dual sport or a naked bike fan, and I most certainly am, it's more likely you're a fan of such bikes because you value load carrying and robustness over speed and looks. But there are millions of squids and cruiser fans out there who disagree. But for the most part, acceleration and top speed does tend to trump robustness in the markets around the world where the mighty car is king. In other markets, though, practicality and usability tend to come first, which leave us with a very interesting conundrum. But just before I get there, I want to clarify what I just said. I, of course, mean naked motorcycles, a style of motorcycle with no fairing as opposed to riding naked, which nobody should do. And if you must know, I am an at-gat rider. I know Portland does its naked bicycle ride every year, but that is for bicycles, not motorcycles, and I'm too old and flabby for that kind of shenanigans. Also, I'm just going to link to a glossary of motorcycle terms because I know I just used at-gat, and if you don't know, you won't know, so... Follow the link below to learn some motorcycle terms. Back to aforementioned conundrum. In markets where reliability and practicality for hauling and commuting come first, range usually takes a back seat to price when it comes to electric two-wheelers. And here's where lower cost electric motorcycles come into their own, because if you're not building for speed or range, you can design and build a motorcycle or a scooter with a small, efficient battery pack. A battery pack that can easily be removed for charging or indeed battery swapping. That lowers the overall cost and it brings us to the exciting future of battery swapping. In markets where motorcycles are the norm rather than the exception, there's already a critical mass of potential users that make batteries as a service a phenomenal business proposition. Deploying battery swap stations around a major city and then charging motorcycle customers for every battery they swap or charge them a predictable rental in the form of a monthly fee, allowing those shorter range two wheelers to gain extra range without needing bulky rapid charging or massive battery packs on the vehicle makes things so much easier for everyone. Because there are already so many potential users, swap stations are regularly used and batteries are regularly tested by the company offering the service or renting out the batteries. What's more, consumers don't have to invest in buying that battery outright. They only buy the bike, leasing the battery and lowering entry costs even further, putting battery swap capable motorcycles at or near price parity with gasoline ones with far fewer service costs. And that means in markets where motorcycles and scooters aren't a common place for commuting, battery swapping is a far less usable proposition. Motorcycles tend to be built as luxury or fun vehicles, and then they have larger price tags caused by those larger, more expensive battery packs required for extra range, onboard DC fast charging capabilities, and higher spec motors needed to carry that extra weight around. That makes battery packs more expensive, that makes motorcycles more expensive, and it pushes people out of ownership potential. 
And the companies that buck the trend of all of this, they're often treated as niche, small volume motorcycles that ultimately fail to get much market traction, have a limited dealer network, and as recently demonstrated by Cake, often find the companies making them declaring bankruptcy or something equally terrible. Would I love to see companies like African-based Rome bring affordable electric motorcycles to major cities across Europe and North America with practical frames, reasonable specs and battery swapping? abso freaking lutely I would love to see battery swapping become commonplace. And I'd love to see motorcycles that are more utilitarian get the battery swapping infrastructure they need to become more common, more practical, and most importantly, more affordable. But, well, without a major shift in how motorcycles and scooters are viewed, without a major change in licensing and road education, and without a program that makes electric motorcycles more than the weekend plaything for the majority of the minority, I'm not sure it will happen. And while there are a small minority of people who commute daily on electric motorcycles in the US and Europe, and there are more affordable electric models coming to market, hi to those riders, by the way. Hi, Chrissa. Those motorcycles nearly always end up having reasonably short service lifespans because motorcycle batteries that aren't swappable and aren't regularly checked at a swap station and are pushed hard during their life are more prone to abuse, degradation and bad stuff, often thanks to months off the road every year for winter. But that is for a different video. Thanks for joining me today. And if you've got thoughts, make sure you leave them below in our Discord chat room, or you can reach out to us on Mastodon. Thanks to the amazing list of people scrolling by on your screen right now. They are more than some of the 1500 people who help fund this channel through Patreon, YouTube, and Ko-fi, covering our bills, paying our team, and making sure we can be 100% independent. If you'd like to join them and see your name listed here, just follow the links below. There are a range of different tiers you can sign up for from as little as $1 a month, or if you pay yearly, just over $10 a year. A huge welcome to our newest supporters. Ken F22, Tom Stovall, Sean Harper, Jeffrey Anderson, Welly Yee, James Finley, Rebecca Fussell, SRS5694, Jack Rupel, BMW K1, Larry Ronning, Sean K, MD, Did Great, Mike Kainka, Mario Murillo, Dave Nelson, Abraham Palmer, Ed Bieler, and Peter Nelson. To join the list and get your shout out, become a paid Patreon member for your week of fame. If you'd like to support us with a one-off donation, you'll find links below to make Kofi and Bitcoin donations. And we even have a good old fashioned PO box you can reach us at, the address is linked below. Also, if you're in need of some swag, you'll find out our swag store in the down below. This month, we are celebrating wrangling EV FUD with an awesome new design by our in-house artist and animator, Erin. Get yours today by heading to our Redbubble store. We've got some great content coming up, so make sure you're subscribed on Peertube or YouTube, and we'll see you soon. We make new videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. If you want more, the mighty algorithm thinks you'll like this video, but we also think that this one is well worth a look. See you soon, and as always, keep evolving!